Okay, hello. Hello. It is Sunday and it's 4.45 about, and I finished a piece today. Sing a Song of Seasons by Blackbird Designs. Stitched in all the called for except for a color or two I substituted in for some things I didn't have in my stash. Haven't decided how I'm gonna finish it yet. I, I went up in the attic and looked for frames and I found a few that would fit but I kind of feel like I'm just gonna finish it as a pen cushion. So I think that's what I'm gonna do. So then I was thinking like, uh, hey, why don't I start a new piece? And I really wanted to um, put together a stitchy tube this weekend, but it just didn't happen. It takes a long time, I know I've mentioned it before, to get everything together, make the notes, and um, you know, like edit and things. And I'm really trying to take it mostly easy on the weekends. And um, but if I shoot a stitch with me, hang with me video, then it's kind of like working for me, but not super like working because I'm going to sit here and stitch anyway. Um, I was watching a little bit of floss tube. I was kind of tidying up so I don't have to look at all these things. Ham rock is here. There's my ham rock right, right here for ham. And I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt. I probably shouldn't be. I look kind of dewy. I'm just so tired of I'm so tired of summer. I'm so tired of it. I think it's only like 89 <laughs> today or 85. It kind of has stormed off and on this week. The nice thing about August is that it kind of feels like summer's just waning and there's not much left. And really once, once we get through the next couple of weeks, things get so much easier. So um, I feel like I'm getting hot. I'm okay. I'm all right. Take my shoes off. Uh, so anyway, I finished a piece, which is exciting. I haven't really started anything new for a while. Um, I kind of just have been on a kind of a finishing, I don't know, what do you call it? Like a finishing mood where I just kind of pick something up and just keep at it until I'm finished with it. And so it was nice to get that one done. That was a stitch mania start, I believe. And I really like greens and blues and browns together. It's very nice. That one is still available as of, um, as of this telling. I did, uh, this week was kind of crazy because Barb and Alma re-released Easter Parade, the chart. And I had pre-ordered it from my distributor and I ordered 25 and I got nine because they said once they filled pre-orders that that was all they had left. So then I contacted Alma at Blackbird. I got another 45 and when I posted those, I posted them in the evening and when I woke up they were gone. So then I emailed Alma again this weekend, I think this it was either this morning or last night, and I said, hey, can I order another 50? And she said, we're out, but wait, don't worry. They're gonna reprint it again. I have no idea how many they actually printed, but they were gone in less than a week, I believe. So don't worry if you, if you don't have one yet. I'm gonna pre-order with my distributor and I'm hoping they print maybe a little more this time just to kinda hopefully get everybody one who would like one of Easter Parade. And um, it's cute, it's an older chart. I'm gonna go get one and show it to you because I still have them. I have to pack my orders from this weekend yet. Okay, I'm back. So here, this is what, oop, this is what it looks like. Easter Parade. And it looks just like the one that came out before. It is from, does it say? Uh, hmm. 2005. Okay, I didn't realize it was as old as that. So in 2005, that was actually right before we moved to Hattiesburg. Just that year before we moved here in 2006. So it's 14 years old. You get po both of the little charts in the one chart. Um, so I think, you know, there were three others that they re-released too. And those are also selling briskly. I, I, I got more of those. I got everything that I ordered for those. So I think I still have those in stock. But anyway, it's cool that they're reprinting things because it's a bummer when you, you see something and you're like, I love that, but I don't want to pay $65 for a $9 chart. Um, I feel like this way, like it makes the designer happy because they already did the work. It's already a created chart. The model's long been done. You know, really, it's just a matter of them lining it up with the printer to print them. Um, so they obviously make money by reprinting an old chart. The distributors make money 
the shops make money and the stitchers are happy because they get something that they want. So it's like a win-win, win-win situation. I can't think of what the, oh, <laughs> the, so the lose situation is somebody who had an Easter parade chart to sell on eBay and they were like, dang it, dang. So they're gonna have to wait five or six years. You're gonna have to hold on to that chart. Okay, so I looked through things to see what I could start. And I just got all these Not Forgotten Farm charts in. And I was I kept joking with Graham about this one. Um, I'll show you what it looks like. There it is there. And it's called The Reverend Gordon Squash Bottom. And I love the name. He's got a cat. He's got a pumpkin head. There's a white house. There's nothing I don't like about that. Um, she said hers was stitched on... Um, 30 count old farmhouse linen from Not Forgotten Farm. That's nothing I have. Oh, you can get a frame. You can get the frame, maybe. Uh, uh, from her Etsy shop. She has an Etsy shop, so you can probably get it there. The charts I have, it only calls for DMC. She has a really cool typewriter, or is a typewriter font. Just, you know, just a tiny list of DMC. So I thought what I would do, um, I found a scrap of linen that was kind of grungy. And um, I pulled out some limited edition, like these thread clubs that I belong to, just to see if I can substitute um, some threads. I just wanna make sure this is recording. Recording, hello, hello, yep. And so what I do if I'm gonna, if I'm going to, um, you know, convert the flosses, people think like, oh, there's a trick to it. There really isn't. Um, it's really just a matter of matching. So if I look at the chart, I'm gonna start in the middle. I'll probably start like on his coat. So that is DMC 400, which I think is kind of a rusty color. I think it's funny to be a stitcher because, you know, like when I came back to the industry a year ago or so, I had all this knowledge was still in my head. I still know fabric colors and designers and floss colors and things like that. And it's pretty useless information in any other industry. You can't like go to a stock brokerage firm and be like, DMC 400 is rust. They don't care. They don't care. So if I look at, I've got one of these cool, um, it's kind of falling apart. It's an actual floss samples. You know, you can get these where it's printed, like it's, like it's photographs, but these are actual, you know, cards with floss on them. And you can just hold it up against your, your collection too. So, um, but here they have like a, somewhere, they have like a key somewhere where you can find like, it's the floss number and then it tells you what column that that is in. So like 400 is on column 15. Okay, so then you just have to look and there it is, that rusty color right there. So then what I'm gonna do is just kind of hold I don't have that many color and cottons yet, but I used some this week and I really liked it. It's very similar to sampler threads, but it doesn't look like I've got one on there that's gonna be rusty enough. Um, I also have, uh, these are Nina's threads. Her threads are lovely. You can find her on Etsy. Um, I think she's in Hungary. And um, she is like the nicest person. Now that is a pretty good match, brown rust. But I'm gonna look to see if, um, I don't know, on the cover, his coat almost looked a little bit more of a bricky red, which maybe I'll look for that. Let me see what I can find. That's kind of a cool cover too. Persian plum. Well, so you just, you just really have to just kind of look through and see. Um, the way that it helps me to think of things is like, okay, is this, a, is this rust a red rust? Or is it a gray, I don't know, grayer rust or a got more yellow in it and you just kind of eventually find like what what you want I feel like that berry is kind of cool but I don't know okay so that was what brown rust so I'm gonna say that's the closest one there and then these are my um, Victorian motto threads that I joined the club a few months back and so you get I think 10 a month plus I think I had ordered like a set or two that I thought were cool and then Jen has given me some. She she has a lot of them too. There's Sierra Sunset. That might be real pretty. That's that's more of a brown brown. It needs to have a little more red in it. This is a good color. Old Red Barn. I like that. 
Okay, so we're gonna just narrow it down. I kind of like that. That's kind of what I'm thinking right now. And you know, uh, I know people get nervous to substitute colors on, on charts, and some people even say like, oh, designers get offended if you change their colors. No, designers don't get offended. I don't think if they do, have a piece of cake. There are other way more important things to worry about than somebody changing your precious floss color. Because it's yours. It's your thing to create. And so the designers don't always have the right, they're choosing from usually from what they have. You know, you get, you get samples and then you buy things. And so you kind of have a stash of threads that you work from when you're designing. But what if like this was the perfect thread, but it wasn't one I had, you know what I mean? This is, I'm gonna actually go with this one because it's, it's more of a, a bricky color than a rusty color. And I feel like the Reverend Gordon squash bottom needs, uh, needs this kind of a coat rather than brown. So Old Red Barn by Victorian Motto is gonna be what I choose. And I probably won't have to choose another color while we're on screen together. But that's all I do if I'm gonna switch up colors. And you can just, um, you know, people say, oh, do a floss toss. So you just put it on the fabric, see how it looks. Is it gonna show up? If you put a few stitches in and you're like, oh, I don't know, just take it out and try something else. And I think it's really cool when people customize things and it's fun to watch videos where people have you know made a piece their own so to say so let me see i'm going to set my timer because i don't want to blather at you guys forever forever although i do love hanging out with y'alls okay so uh that's what i'm going to start with and then one of the things i've been doing lately is using i, I bought a dozen just cheapo clipboards on amazon they all came together and when you have these little charts, you know, you're kind of like trying to hold them and stuff. I don't have like a fancy stand, like a music stand or whatever for my charts. And I find actually that these little just cheapy um, uh, clipboards just to do a really good job. And I think it would be fun, and some weekend maybe I will, is to decoupage with um, Mod Podge. I always thought it was Mod Podge. It's mod, it's very mod. Um, and put stuff on here, be kind of fun to decorate it. Um, but I'm not gonna do that today because I'm gonna sit and stitch. So I'm gonna go ahead and start on him. I think that's pretty close to the center, so I should be good. All right, I'm sitting back. I'm sitting back because we're gonna, we're gonna hang together, right Ruby? Right Ruby? Yeah. She's a head butter. If you, um, if you have a cat, or if you don't, when a cat headbutts you, it means they like you. And uh, I read a cute story online from somebody who said that she has a cat that's very friendly to other people, but if somebody new comes over and the cat and her cat is really sweet to them, she'll say like, oh, that's unusual. She really doesn't normally warm up to somebody like that, just so her company feels good about themselves. I think that's nice, don't you, Ruby? Ruby is one that likes to help pack orders. So it, when we're cutting fabric, she is a, she just loves to be looking kind of like blubbery. I actually have lost another two pounds. I think it was having workmen in the house. Sorry, Ruby. She um, wants to be all up in our business when we're packing orders. I think she would love to be an employee. And I would totally let her be an employee. So now I'm just trying to decide, like, when you have hand-dyed fabric, like, I typically go for the grungier side but then I'm just kind of trying to decide like what looks like the top and what looks like the bottom I feel like the darker needs to be on the bottom because so it's weighted and then what I do to find the center is I fold it in half and make a crease and then I fold it in half again and I push on that um, center fold where the the two halves meet and it's right there and so then I'll usually stick my needle in to where that center was and uh, I don't count all the way from the edges. I don't even use a ruler unless I, I feel like my, I know I left myself uh, about two inches on the top and bottom. That's really all I need. I don't often do more than two inches allowance just because it, I don't frame with matting and it just goes to waste otherwise. Plus it's just more to hang on to. Now this one, if I look, I'm gonna count over just a few stitches just to see 
what I can do here to get, um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're gonna just count over seven. Well, let's do, I don't know what this is. All right, we're in. All right, and um, we're off to the races. So what was this? This was Victorian motto threads. She's very sweet. If you haven't seen her threads yet, I feel like I need more. You're gonna look at me and, oh, that's way better. She, okay, so she is on eBay and she's been on eBay for a long time. And I noticed her quite a while back, probably, I mean, seven years ago or something, I started noticing her things. She sells a lot of patterns um, that are like the old perforated paper kind of motto samplers that would have been from like the later 1800s, early 1900s, that kind of era. And um, so she sells designs and I actually carry some of her cross stitch designs in my shop. Um, I asked about her threads and she said she doesn't really wholesale them because they're so inexpensive to begin with that she just really wouldn't have the kind of a margin that she could make any money if she was selling them to shops. So I do recommend her threads. They're, they seem very nice. I've used them a couple times and um, they're soft. They're very, very gently shaded. It's, um, there's not a lot of variegation in them, which is mostly what I prefer these days in variegated threads. I used to think the stripier the better just because it was so interesting to stitch with. But then sometimes your piece to me looks really busy and like there's just too much stuff going on. So um, I, the, the more gently shaded, the better. I had a few other charts pulled out to maybe start, but I don't know, this one I just, like I said, I feel like since Graham and I were kind of joking about the rev. And there's something about August that to me, I immediately go to pumpkins. You know, it's, um, summer's over. Sorry guys, summer's over. <laughs> summer's over, even though it's a while until summer's officially over. You know, people, the back to school supplies are at Target. And uh, they had, last weekend was the tax-free weekend on clothing. They have that here once a year. Um, so parents can get their kids school clothes and shoes and things cheaper. And so really, you know, people have taken their summer vacations and we're back in business. I, uh, to me, September can't come fast enough. It, you know, it used to be that kind of the opposite where I, you know, when I lived up in North Dakota, I. You hate for summer to end because you know what is at the end of that is um, brutal, bitter, cold misery. But here, to me, I really, you know, mid mid September through mid May, it's just beautiful. Oops, I made made a mistake already. No problem. I can catch I can catch it. I did two stitches instead of three. That's what happens when you're talking to your friends. So anyway, so then August, you know, I feel like it's sunflowers and pumpkins and cinnamon. And what else, Ruby? What else, Ruby? Here, uh, people ask about like the colors changing here in, in, the, in the south, in the south south. And we don't really get a big color change. There are a few maple trees out by PetSmart on a berm that, a berm, berm, that change color. And it's funny because it cha they change color when it's still hot outside. So I'm assuming that it has to do with the angle of the sun or how long the sun is out or whatever, that they just start knowing that it's time to, to turn. But really, if, if there are trees down here where they're going to go dormant for the, um, for the, <laughs> the winter as it is, they just turn brown and the leaves drop off. And then in the spring, they bloom again. So we don't really get the pretty, you know, red, gold, orange, rust, all those beautiful fall colors. So, you know, when people say like, oh, I like to live somewhere where there are seasons, I get that because here you don't, summer is kind of miserable. Autumn could is nice, but it could be prettier. Winter, there's no snow. Uh, and, you know, spring is fine. There's always something really blooming here in Mississippi. And when, when I moved here, there's a program on N, NPR, Missi Mississippi Public Radio, called the Gestalt Gardener. And it's a nice Southern gentleman who I think works with like the extension service here in the state. And he talks about gardening and 
trees and flowers and things and I think the first year we were here I was listening to it and he used to have somebody on with him that was like his partner and his partner said one time you know if it's if um you, something about how if, if you don't always have something blooming in your garden there's something wrong with you bless your heart because pretty much there's always there this color is great by the way there's always something blooming here in Mississippi and that's pretty nice I will say we miss out on things like apples don't really do well here no lilacs no um, rhubarb no peonies uh, no 24 inch blizzards no 60 below wind chill so there are trade-offs there definitely are and I mean there are magnolias down here which are very pretty um, my youngest one two three complains about um, just the that the trees are always so uniform one two three how big is it okay and then four three four he compl always had complained about the pine trees. Just He felt just like it was the same tree over and over again down here, which there is. I mean, we're in the pine belt. So it's a belt made of pine, and that's where we live. So he got pretty sick of it immediately, but he said now he's kind of used to it, and it's not so bad. Uh, he went with me north to Minnesota last month, and we had a good time. Uh, he does like seeing the trees up there. It's just a little bit more variety, but... Of course, summer in Minnesota is beautiful, but there, I mean, really, once it gets to be, you know, September, you're just, you're hoping and wishing that the snow will stay away through uh, Halloween. I think, I saw somewhere in the news this week that they were talking about, like, there's a push to change the date of Halloween, that instead of having it be on October 31st, that it would be, you know, they'd move it to like where it was the last, the um, maybe like the last Saturday of the month of October, which to me is a great idea because, you know, as a parent and even as a kid, when you trick or treat the night before and then a, a school day, it makes it hard. Like you're, you have to go to bed and you're all hyped up and you, you get home and it's, you got to put your costume on and it just would be nice to have like a leisurely day where you could have a party you know, have a nice meal for lunch, get your costume on. And I think the Snickers company, whoever makes Snickers, is it Mars? Said that they would give away a million dollars worth of Snicker bars if they changed the date. And I think it would be cool. I think it would be cool. I always thought it was kind of a shame to um, put those kind of limitations on Halloween. We, uh, you know, since I, I did grow up in, in the north, there were some Halloweens that it actually snowed or we had snow or it was bitterly cold. And so I have, you know, pictures of me in my costume with like a coat under the costume. Those are back, you know, when you would get the, the costumes came like in a paper box with a cellophane window on the front. And the masks were made out of just this really cheap plastic with a gray rubber band to hold it on your face. And the, the body part of your costume was just held together with like a string that you tied around your neck. Um, so, I, I mean, I think costumes definitely are nicer quality these days. But there was just something really cool to me, three and then four, about the box. The box. I don't know. Because they we would go, I know that there was a shoe store up in Fargo that we used to sometimes go to get our costumes at and they would have all the boxes out you know laying face up so you could look down into them and see the masks that came with them um, somebody's mask always broke like the first couple houses and that kind of stinks this is going to be smaller than it looks his little arm is tiny I better make sure let's see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Perfect. This is going to be great. I love this color. And I just, the Reverend Gordon, squash bottom. <laughs> so to me, autumn stitching is really fun. And 
I just, I even think of like samplers as kind of being a schoolgirl, kind of back to school. You know, I just really get in the stitchy mood. And typically, you know, this time of year for shops, at least for me, it always was a really busy time. People came back after their summer vacations and, uh, you know, they kind of started to hunker down for the winter. And so you would just see kind of an uptick in people getting patterns and fabrics and threads to work on their summer projects. But as it is now, pretty much it's busy all the time. Okay, so this is Nineteen. Okay. So um, I almost started. There were a couple of little kind of more samplery pieces, but I I didn't want to start um, a big project because I have a number of those going that I'd like to try to get finished up. I've been working off and on, you know, the last couple months, especially on my Kathy Barrick. Village of Hawk Run and that's going really well. It's very fun to stitch and I'm excited about um, getting that one finished up because I had a frame that's going to fit perfectly which is super duper. I'm not even, I'm not counting. It was 19 right guys? So I've got that and I've got some other reproductions that I've got going that are pretty big. Um, I know that there's a Miss Marianne Bourne group going on now too. I really should take mine out and stitch along with them. It's a lovely sampler by Hands Across the Sea. It is not out of print. I'm stitching mine in DMC. I kind of wish I had done it in silk because it would just give it a little bit more, um, you know, kind of a shininess to it. But it's really gonna be lovely the way it is. It really will. Can't remember what kind of fabric I'm stitching it on. Something hand dyed, I'm sure. I think an R and R fabric. Her charts are so great; they're very easy to read and well done. But that's my favorite sampler of hers, anyway. Um, it's just so unusual. All right, what do you think, Ruby? Is that 19? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Up, oh, up. Got one more. 19. I can feel it in my bones. We drove past Krispy Kreme the other day and the line was super long to Krispy Kreme. And we don't really often go to Krispy Kreme anymore. I remember back maybe like 15 years ago or 16 years ago, it was like the, you know, I mean, it was the new big thing. I know Krispy Kreme had been around for a long time, but I think they were really starting to like expand like crazy. And all these Krispy Kremes went up that are no longer up because I think they just over saturated the market with Krispy and cream. And they're they're good. I mean, you don't get me wrong. I'm not going to look a donut in the mouth. But uh, I'm not a huge fan of glazed donuts because I find them to be sticky. And I like cake donuts better. But anyway, so there's this huge line of people at Krispy Kreme and I said to Steve oh my gosh what's what's going on at Krispy Kreme today and he said oh I don't know I mean maybe it's just the hot signs on so we looked it up when we got home and Friday they were doing a uh, deal where if you bought a dozen donuts then you got a dozen chocolate glazed donuts for two dollars so that's what was going on at Krispy Kreme and so it looked like and that was that was like six o'clock at night and there was a huge line of people I used to like uh, our local Krispy Kreme that up in Fargo that closed, and now it's a mattress store, I want to say. Uh, they had the filled donuts that, okay, so this, these are just going to go straight up, so I'm going to go in one. They had filled donuts that were like, instead of like being frosted on the top or glazed in some way, they were... Um, rolled in cinnamon and sugar and then there was like a chunky apple filling in the middle and those were really good and I don't think ours does those or has done them and so I don't have the time of day I kind of feel like if you're gonna eat a donut eat a really good donut that you're gonna super super enjoy because there's nothing redeeming about a donut except that it makes you feel happy for that five minutes it takes you to eat it <laughs> it's uh 
I guess that's my philosophy on dessert and candy anyway. I'm not just gonna eat it just because, well, what does it say? They say a lifetime on the, or a moment on the lips forever on your hips or whatever. You gotta really go for quality. We have, uh, we have a local donut place called Shipley's here that is supposed to be expanding out into my, more towards my neighborhood, you know, on this end of town. But they had some trouble with the building they were going into, so now they've gotta regroup. They make really good donuts. It's probably not a good thing that they're moving closer because they're far enough away. You know how like there's something in your town and it's like really good, but it's like just far enough away that you don't make the special trip just to go there. You know, anytime you would think of it, you don't, you're like, nah, I'm not gonna make a special trip. And then sometimes when you just happen to be driving by, you're like, oh, it's a weird time of day, or you don't really feel like having a donut. So I've, I mean, I've had Shipley donuts maybe four times in 13 years. So maybe I just hope that they, do. no, I don't hope they, they don't find a spot. I hope they do find a spot and they do a good, good business because donuts, <laughs> donuts fill a need in society, I guess. It's funny that like, I mean, I guess there are cake stores, but there's not really like a cookie store. There are bakeries that sell cookies. Well, no, okay, so Mrs. Fields, I guess, would be a cookie store. What do I know? What do I know? There's the kind of that old, age-old question like pie or cake. And I guess I always answer that question with the question, which is whose pie and whose cake? It depends, right? Um, I don't like ice cream cake from Dairy Queen. I just don't. From Baskin Robbins. It's pretty much awesome. And pie to me, it's gotta be homemade. I don't know that I've really ever had pie that knocked my socks off. I feel like oftentimes they get, oh! <laughs> Here's Peaches. Hi, Peach. What you doing? You gonna come sit down? Sit down. I think pie places often get the filling right, but they never get the crust right. To me, it's rare to find, I mean, I can't, I literally cannot think of a time that I had crust that I was like, that is good crust. A lot of times it's way too dry or way too sticky sweet or overdone or way too thick. And they just, I don't know, I'm pretty good at making pie, I will say. And so I guess I'm biased in that. Um, and I certainly don't enjoy a pie out of the freezer section. Those are not gonna be good pies. Once again, I feel like if you're gonna eat something, make it good. Now ice cream is another story. You can get that out of the freezer section and have good ice cream. I like haagen and I like Ben and & Jerry's, and I like, um, what is it, Bluebell? Bluebell ice cream. But, you know, everything in moderation, I guess. It's funny how we talk about, you know, desserts, but people aren't like, okay, so, you know, broccoli or cauliflower, which I would have to go broccoli because cauliflower is just kind of bitter. And all these pizzas that they're making with the cauliflower crust, that's kind of weird to me. Once again, if you're gonna eat pizza, eat pizza. Save the cauliflower for another day. I'm not even really all that hungry, so I'm not sure why I got to, on food. Why did I get onto food, Ruby? We don't know. Um, okay, so. I'll talk about this probably on my next video. Not everybody watches my hang with me videos. Some people actually even begged me not to make them. One, two, three, and in one. Because they don't like to watch stitch with me videos. And I feel like that's okay. You don't have to watch it. Uh, I wanted to make a video this week. This is the easiest way for me to stay in touch with you guys this particular week. So that's what you get. Um... But uh, Graham is gonna be coming and working five days a week now. I just cannot keep up with, um, I can I am keeping up with getting orders out and like, you know, 
placing orders and getting in inventory and adding new things to the website, but just barely. And he's been helping me two to three days a week. So I said, look, I have to have two days a week to design because I'm getting no designing done. I don't have time. And so um, he's gonna start working pretty much full time, which is gonna be great. So there are parts of it that he'll be able to really just kind of take over and I'll only have to poke my head in sometimes. He still doesn't want to cut fabric, which I don't blame him. It's not, it's not uh, for the faint of heart because hand dyed linen, which is mainly what I sell for fabric, is expensive and if you cut it wrong, that's a big bummer. So I said, you know, the worst case scenario is I get the, you know, cut the linen that goes with the invoices that are printed and then he just takes care of filling like the charts and things, which is very easy. Harrison moves out in a couple of weeks to go to Denver to go to school. He's going to grad school at the University of Denver to study counseling, which is going to be great. It's a great school and it's going to be a huge adventure for him, but his leaving will uh, free up the bedroom that's just down the hall. And so that's going to be the new office and this craft room will become less cluttered looking. I've already pulled a bunch of stuff out of here and it's in the living room in preparation for that. We had uh, workmen come in for 15 out of 17 days this last month in a row. So I had two Sundays off, but then otherwise it was 15 days. And they painted everything, one, two, three, four, in one. And they replaced the humongous floor in the out there you can kind of see it through the door there it's it looks like wood but it's porcelain tile and uh, it's great and then they did two the two bedrooms on the other side of the house these rooms are carpet now and we'll stay carpet for a while I think I'm fine with it the thing about cats is hairballs and you know I guess somewhat shedding and things like that but you know, they say you can have a nice house or you can have pets and children. And I guess we had pets and children. And our house is very, very nice, but things don't stay. We could never like go all white furniture. That's just a, that's just a dream. Right, Ruby? You'd get your black fur all over it. And uh, that's fine. I'd rather have pets and children. I missed the lucky rabbit this weekend. I was gonna go and then I just was like, oh, you know what? It's, the lucky rabbit is great. It's super fun. It's in a big, big old um, warehouse downtown. But the problem is that it's not heated and it's not cool. So when you go in August and it's 90 degrees outside, it's like 103 in the building. And so it's hard to linger when you're sweating buckets. It's still super fun, but I figure I'll go in September and um, they'll have some fun fall stuff out and I'll, I'll maybe shoot a video again so you guys can see what they got that time of year. Right, Ruby, I'm almost to the end of this thread. I can check actually and see how long it took me to finish one thread. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, up one. This is cute. I wonder if Jennifer's done this one. She loves pumpkin head people. I don't know why it's a thing, pumpkin head people. It's cute. <laughs> I don't know why. And also terrifying. I mean, if somebody really had a pumpkin head, it would be terrifying, especially if it was one of those warty ones with all the lumps and bumps. There's, you know, there are smells that take you back to your childhood. And to me, like pumpkin guts is one of those smells. Like when you cut into a pumpkin, and it's kind of just that sweet, you know, vegetable-y smell and the texture of the kind of wet noodles of the innards coming out and the seeds. It um, takes you back. Just like for me, um, the smell of fresh, freshly sharpened pencils. I go right back to Sister Eugenia's first grade classroom. That's where I associate pencil smell with to back when I was six years old. I saw at Target they've got uh, Crayola came out with like yucky and yummy markers and crayons and things this year. So you could get, you know, yummy I think was mostly fruit smells and then yucky was like old boot, tire, 
I don't know, like onion, rotten egg, stuff like that. And uh, I think that's cool. I loved the idea of smelly things, like smelly stickers. I have some stamps right now that you may still be able to find at your local post office. They have popsicles on them and they smell like fruit. They're scratch and sniff actual US postage stamps. So that's kind of fun. But they had those, what were they called? Like the Sanford markers. Those were the only kinds that you could get with the fragrances where they um, kind of had the funny caps and black was licorice and brown was cinnamon. And those two, those, if I smell those kind of markers, that takes me back to, to back in the day. Whoops, there goes my light. All right, how long did it take me to stitch one yard of thread? Oh, half an hour. I guess I'm making small stitches. Hey, Ruby, where's my thread? Hey, can I, can I have it? Thank you. Oh, pets. Oop, there we go. I've got Galleria coming up in September, so that's kind of weighing on my mind, and I've got stuff to get ready for Lindy's retreat in November. In October, I'm going to the Midwest Cross Stitchers retreat. So I've got a lot of traveling coming up, which is okay. Um, I just have stuff to get ready. Last year was my first year back at um, the St. Charles Consumer Show in a while. I, I went the first few years that it was run, one, two, three, four, five, six, by Old Colonial Designs. And they did such a good job running it. And Kathy does a great job of running the Galleria show. And it's um, super fun. It's like 400 stitchers. And this year I'm actually gonna be on a different floor. And uh, I'm, I think I'm on the floor below most of the, the, floor, the people. And Kathy was trying to help me get a bigger space because last year my booth was so busy that there were a lot of people that complained they never could even get into my booth. And I, I didn't want that. I wanted people to be able to come in and see what I had. And um, I'm looking for helpers this year. So if you're gonna be at the show and you'd like to help out in my booth, I will pay you with stuff. You can go shopping in my <laughs> booth um, just to help like write invoices and run charges and things. But it's I, I basically have what would be the size of a suite um, and but it's a, entirely one big room and I think it's it'll have a bar in it which will probably be where we check people out but our room will also be next door and I haven't decided yet if I'm also going to use that room for anything I'm gonna take a ton of stuff again this year I'm gonna have to rent more tables I already got in um, some kind of fun products from a place I got last year Last year, the big thing, one of the big things that I brought that was super popular were these mason jars that are like a gallon, they'll hold a gallon. And um, farm girl, Michelle Rudy, bought one and carried it around. People were like, where'd you get that? And luckily I was able to get them again this year. I think I ordered 40. I hated to do much more than that because, because they come in such large boxes, they, they're gonna take up a lot of room in the van. And so I will have those again this year if you wanted one last year and you weren't able to get one. But I have some other of that kind of fun stuff too, but I'm just gonna have a great time bringing, just, you know, just my husband said, what are you taking? And I said, everything, almost everything. I don't think I'll probably take like classic color works and sampler threads because I think there are some other shops that do take those threads and do a better job of displaying them. I don't have any display pieces for, for showing that many threads on. And I just don't know that I wanna mess with getting that all set up. So there's really no point in, you know, cause I guess people have threads and it's, I would guess that most people are going to, you know, just pick up the thread or two they need for the project they're doing. I think I will take my Gloriana though and my um, thread gatherer silks. Cause I think those are things that once people say that, see them in person, then they're like, oh, well, that's really beautiful. I wanna get a skein of that and give that a try. But I'll take ball pointed needles. I'll have to order a bunch more of those. They came in and flew out real quickly and so I'm waiting for another big batch of those. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So into. 
cool. Uh, I haven't tried the ball pointed needles yet. I have them to try. I don't know if stitching in hand how they do, how they do. I'll really have to, to give it a go. I have the size 26 and 28s in stock. I didn't get 24s. I sell some size 24, but really not a lot. Most people want the 26s and the 28s in needles. So I'll have to give them a try. I know people are really jazzed about them. And that's cool. It's fun to have, you know, like a new take on an old idea. I mean, when, when was the last time there was like new needle technology? I mean, it's kind of, kind of basically been the same basic idea for many a year. Right, Reverend Gordon Squash Bottom? This is gonna really be cute. The color I'm noticing, so what did I say it was? Barn something? It is very much like um, Brick by Weeks Dye Works, I'm gonna say. I don't know, I don't know where this one came from. If it was, if I bought it as a separate, cause you can buy some of her colors separately, or if it came as part of a kit, or if it was part of the club, or if Jennifer gave it to me, I just know that it's on my ring. And it's fun to use different kinds of thread. Uh, I have been using some DMC lately too. What did I do recently that had DMC? I don't remember, but it's all good. It's all good, in two again, and then in one. The cool thing starting here on his jacket is I can do his face <laughs> today still probably. So then um, that'll be fun to put his face in. I, on a piece like this, I start in the middle pretty much. Um, if it's a sandler, I often start in the upper left corner. There's really not a right or wrong way to do it. The main thing you want to be aware of is don't start in the wrong place so that you run out of fabric. That is, that's just one of the worst feelings. I'm trying to think if I've really ever done that. I'm sure I have. I can't think of a time, but I'm sure that I have. I do know when I was, uh, I started stitching when I was about 10 and I was at 4-H camp and they had a canteen and you could get like Hubba Bubba there and Jolly Ranchers, you know, probably marathon bars and things like that. And they had little craft kits that you could also buy. And there were like, you know, I suppose leather wallet kits and that those plastic lanyard kits and they had a needlepoint kit that came with um, just needlepoint canvas. So in two, in two, and then in one, and in one. And okay, so it came with needlepoint canvas. It was probably like an 18 count maybe. And then some flosses and a needle and a black and white just photocopied chart. So that would have been like 1980. And I was like, I wonder if I could try that. So I bought it and I worked on it at camp. I don't know where it went. I pr I'm probably threw it away um, because I didn't know anything about how to stitch and the directions were minimal. <laughs> so, and it wasn't that I couldn't follow directions. It just, I don't think there, there really were much, there wasn't much for directions. So I started in the very bottom corner of the canvas and then I started with the color of thread that it called for, which was the cream background. And then I would stitch like let's say 10 stitches and then if it called for red I would start I would take the thread off my needle re-thread it with the red stitch with the red until it stopped which might have just been a couple of stitches then re-thread my needle with the cream and carry it across like I just I thought you had to like uh oh you know why because it uh it would, would have been how I would have done um latch hook rugs which was basically just like eating corn on the cob you just start at one end all the way across until you finish. And so that's how I did it. And it didn't work super great because I had just lots of carrying on the back and I'm sure my tension was pretty crappy and, but I had a good time, I had fun. I thought it was fun. And so then that, that kind of started my, my interest in just needlework in general. And um, so then it was, you know, I took a class at school on cross stitch for my music teacher and I got some kits I got a kit for my aunt Mary on how to cr uh, cross stitch with and that, that came with linen and I actually did that one over one I think 
and then Santa Claus got me a few embroidery kits and then I was just off and running and then by the time I was 12 I um, was spending money <laughs> I was spending money buying needlework stuff and that was back in the day when you could go to like oh is that an hour already no no it's just a message from AT&T uh, that was back in the day when you could go to like a you know a store in the mall and they had a whole section of like cruel work and cross stitch kits and it would be just like at Dayton's or um, Delandresies. I don't know if you guys had Delandresies. I think who bought them out? It wasn't Belk, but somebody like that. Okay, so then what do we got? Okay, and then this is just gonna be making his coat downwards. So, and it was always fun. I would, you know, when you're a kid, you don't have much for money. And I, I used to babysit and I made a dollar an hour if I was lucky. And uh, so I would spend my hard earned you know, <laughs> my hard-earned babys babysitting money on needlework kits. I, uh, I don't know. I, you know, I, I think I was a good babysitter. I started when I was pretty young. I think, I think when I was nine, really, people's relatives started leaving their children with me, which was probably too young. I didn't know CPR or anything like that. Um. But anyway, I, I just, I know that one of the things that I thought when I was babysitting is that babysitting meant you being ready for anything. And so even when the parents didn't come home until like one in the morning, and this was after me going to school for an entire week, it might be Friday night and I'm there from six until like one in the morning, I would just stay awake and sit on the couch. And sometimes I would be awake so long that the shows would run out. Like I would watch the news at 10. The kids are in bed by this time, right? The house is cold because it's North Dakota. And uh, there's nothing to do except watch just regular TV, you know, four stations, NBC, ABC, CBS, PBS, and then, you know, Fox if I was lucky. And I would just sit on the couch and then, and then you would, eventually it would get late enough where they would start pl playing the <laughs> Star Spangled Banner and then it would just go to static. And then there was literally nothing to do. Um, I might, you know, like tune the, the radio and try to get something to listen to. But like, I don't know why no adult ever said, when the kids go to bed at 10, if you wanna, here's a blanket on the couch, if you wanna lay down, feel free. I don't know why no adult ever said that to me and why I felt like, I had to feel like I was earning my dollar an hour, I guess. But I generally, I think I did a pretty good job. I used to play games with the kids and make food. And I remember one house I would fold her laundry for her and uh, you know do some like light housework while her son was sleeping. He was a young, young lad. So that those, those early cross stitch purchases were, were well earned a dollar an hour sometimes not even there was a single lady that I used to babysit her son sometimes and he was nice he was a little rambunctious I don't remember his name I still can see their house but she was a single lady and so I I guess she would go out I don't know to the bar maybe or I'm not sure what where she would go but I mean she would come home and I would get like four dollars for like you know five or six hours or whatever it's just like oh The best was babysitting for the Yeefers, Amy and what was her brother's name? I don't remember her brother's name. I can see them both. Blonde hair and big blue eyes. She was a bit of a biter. Joe, Joe Geefer and Amy Geefer. So if, Joe and Amy, if you're watching, I still remember babysitting you. But they would sometimes, I would, I would babysit for like eight hours, but I would make like 20 bucks, which to me felt like winning the lottery. Their dad would always hand me a 20, take me home. God, that was the best. I don't know what kids make now when they babysit. It's probably way more than a dollar an hour. What do you think, Ruby? She doesn't know, she's a cat. This one's gonna go pretty quick, I feel like. I've stitched a few, I, 
I don't know, have I finished a Not Forgotten Farm? I don't think I've finished one yet. I have a few in my to-do pile that I'm, I'm working on. Salem Sisters and um, maybe like Salem Village or something like that. I think I have two that I'm working on. Her, her patterns are very uh, cute all done up. The covers aren't always the best. The, the uh, covers often look a little bit washed out in terms of the printing. But if you go on her Etsy store or my, my shop, I've got quite a few of her charts. Not Forgotten, uh, Not Forgotten uh, Farms, right? Not Forgotten Farms. Uh, they're very, very cute. And she uses just very basic, basic supplies. DMC floss, a piece of fabric, you're good to go. She does a lot of other cool stuff like punch needle and um, like kind of primitive stitchery. What did I do there? I really feel like I'm about ready to go up in a size on my cheaters, which is a bummer. This fabric is pretty tight too, which just means it's gonna be cuter. So one of the things I have to do for Galleria is um, I have to decide what models I'm taking. So then I have to make sure I have all of those charts. Last year I took, um, what's it called? Um, the Primitive Hair, a Halloween sampler with the 31 days. And I sold out of that one so quick. So I gotta make sure I get a lot of those charts. It's very cute, all done up. And then I actually am gonna have a trunk show with uh, Lori Markovic from La Dida. I'm gonna have about 25 of her models there. She wasn't able to attend the show this year. Um, but I'm gonna have a bunch of her models there so you can see those, which is really cool. She's very, very nice. And her pieces stitch up really cute too. The nice thing about her pieces is she doesn't do anything humongous. So they're all very kind of um, achievable projects as far as getting them done in a reasonable amount of time. Sometimes you get into a project and you're like, oh my gosh, I will never finish this. And you just have to say, self, you will finish this because you're gonna stick at it. There gets to be that point in your project where you, I, for me anyway, where it's kind of like the horse coming around the bends and seeing the barn, where you're just, you know, galloping towards the finish line. When you can see that finish and it's almost there, that's so fun. I get bogged down often in the starting of something because it's like, I don't know, it just seems like you, you put your few, first few stitches in and you're like, well, I'm nowhere near done. But, I don't know, you know. One of the things I do with my, my projects is I don't like to refer much to the cover after I start. Now with this one, I might just to kind of check colors and things um, because I'm substituting. But I like to kind of have there be surprises. So like uh, if I was stitching a piece, like let's say uh, His Eyes on a Sparrow by Heartstring Samplery, I would really enjoy not knowing as I as I went along like what the next motif was gonna be or what colors it was gonna be in because I kind of just pay attention to where I'm at right now. And so then it's almost like all these little surprises around the corner. Um, this piece obviously isn't quite as big and so there's not a lot for surprises as far as motifs go. But the colors can still be a bit of a surprise. And I think it's gonna be really, really cute. Well, hi, Grumpy. I don't know if I've ever really introduced you guys to Grumpy, have I? People, when they meet Grumpy, do you want me to move that for you? You want me to move Hamrock? When people meet Grumpy and I say, this is Grumpy, they go, oh, oh, okay. And it's like, no, but she's, she's not Grumpy. We did not name her. She was named by the volunteer at the shelter who found her. I've talked, I know I've talked about her. Her, her tail was hanging off. So the volunteer took her to the vet and had her tail, I mean, I think most of it fell off by the time she made it to the vet, but they kind of stitched her back together. They don't know, you know, if she was attacked or if she had gotten her tail slammed in a door or something, uh, but they went ahead and fixed her as, as well, as long as they had her knocked out. And um, she was feral. I mean, she was, a, she was a feral cat. Now there are several kinds of feral. Um, the easy, to me, the easiest kind of feral to, I don't know if you want to call it rehabilitate or kind of talk into becoming somebody's pet is the angry feral, believe it or not. Angry ferals, you can get to a point, a lot of times if you, if you can just 
touch him in the right way, like under the chin or something. I, I had a cat once that was feral that I, it was hissy, like, <laughs> like that. And I got it under its chin and its pupils just went, you know, like from tiny to like, whoop. you could just see the cat. And then instantly the cat was like, liked people, <laughs> like just liked people. Scared ferals are super hard to rehabilitate. And I've, I've, you know, I've had my number, a number of losses in that regard where they, you know, gave me a cat to try to, you know, to get to where it could be a, a pet. And what they do nowadays is they, those cats that are kind of just feral to be feral, that they kind of beyond all hope for becoming a lap cat, that those cats, they, um, they actually give out for free at the shelter. They fix them, they give them their vaccinations, check them over for any health issues, and then they go and be farm you know, like barn cats or, you know, property cats to kind of help control mice um, with the understanding that the people who take care of them will make sure that their, you know, basic needs are met, that they have also have another source for food and water and that if they're, you know, injured or sick or whatever, that they take care of them. But Grumpy was a scared feral. And so she lived in our bathroom for like a month. And the poor deer, I mean, she wanted so badly to trust people and I would go in a couple times a day and just sit on the toilet and talk to her. Just look at her, talk to her. Um, she would just just shake and um, you know, you could just sometimes kind of touch her and um, she wanted to be touched, but then she did not want to be touched also. So then I started just leaving the bathroom door open just to crack so she could kind of smell the rest of the house and the other cats to kind of get used to the idea and that went okay and then eventually it was opened more than a crack so that if she wanted to go out she could and she did start exploring the house at night but not while we were up and then eventually she just kind of stayed out of the bathroom but she mainly hid under the couch and that was probably how long was that grumpy two or three months of being kind of under the couch and we just let her have her time right didn't we we let her have her time under the couch and then <laughs> she started kind of coming out then we just didn't make eye contact we just you know we have a pretty quiet household so we just were very calm and then she kind of started like kind of swinging closer towards us and closer towards us and once in a while we would reach for her and just kind of basically just you know basically barely touch her and um, she would kind of get a little bit jittery, but she liked it, but she, she was still nervous about it. And eventually then she just got to where she is now, where she's just, you know, pretty much a normal cat. Now she doesn't like to be picked up, but she will come sit on my lap and she does sleep on my pillow at night, a lot of nights. So she's a very, very nice cat. Now we weren't looking for another cat. That's kind of how it always goes with us. We weren't looking for another cat. So I took her to the shelter thought we should rename her Happy Cat because we didn't want to scare people off that she was grumpy because she's really not. She just looked like Grumpy Cat. That's why the volunteer named her Grumpy. I know. So took her to the shelter and no one could even touch her. She was terrified. So after like 10 days, you know, they called and they were like, we, she, she's not adoptable. Like she know people want to give her a chance, but they can't even pet her. So I went to the shelter and she was in a cage and I started talking to her and she was scared. But then like I opened the cage and she saw who it was. And it was like, she was like, where have you been? Why did you bring me to this awful place? So we took her home and she just is our cat now. And she's very, very nice. Aren't you grumpy? She's probably one of our best behaved cats in terms of just getting along with everybody and, um, you know, being really quiet and tidy right grumpy doesn't really get hairballs she's pretty healthy mm -hmm. just doesn't like to be picked up and we don't I mean I don't like to be picked up either so I can't say that I blame her right Ruby well it's got to be about time for me to shut up here I'm almost to the end of my other thread and I'll have to show you as far as I got I'll just finish up until I get to the end of this I guess this is gonna be fun to stitch though. I think this is one of my hand dyed linens and I have a bunch of them now that are ironed that I just need to get named and up on the site. 
Uh, that's one of the things Graham's going to help me with is um, hand dyeing fabrics. Um, I've been teaching him how to do it. And uh, there are a lot of the steps of the process that I don't need to be involved with. You know, I can iron fabric, but I would rather spend that time designing. He can iron fabric. He can, you know, run it through a lot of the steps that I have. Um, I'll still cut it, I think, because I cut it into halves, half yard cuts. So this was, I don't know what color this was. Rock salt, maybe, I think, no, is it? No, this was grunge, I think. I kind of try to do silly names because, you know, people have a lot of food names or herbs or spices or, you know, kind of holiday type names. So I just do weird names. Polyester pantsuit is one of them. Uh, cookie crumb is one of my more popular ones when I do that. Squirrel's butt. I need to try to make some more squirrel's butt. People like that. It's kind of a, it really, I mean, it's just brown but people just want to have the fabric that's called squirrel's bud because it's kind of funny. Right, Grumpy? Oh, what fabric do you stitch that on? Squirrel's bud. I think I'll post this tomorrow. I'm really trying not to do too much work on Sundays. It's hard because I, one of the things about working at home and I've said this for years, is when you work at home, you live at work. And I know some designers, uh, like Lizzie Kate, her, her business was in her basement, and then eventually they built a building on, outside in their yard. That was her building for like designing and filling orders and, you know, packaging things and whatever, that that was all in that separate house. And there are other people that, you know, it's like they have a designated area of the house that's just for business and that's pretty much how it is here too once um, Harrison leaves too there the my craft room will no longer be my craft room and my business room it'll just be my craft room for relaxing I'll be able to leave my sewing machine out that'll be nice I'll be more apt to use it and just have a designated spot for that not everybody could work at home I don't think you have to be pretty disciplined to, I mean, it would be super easy to get into a pattern of just like, oh, I don't need, you know, I'll, I'll catch up tomorrow. Then you get into trouble. So you got to kind of keep at it every day, have a good schedule in your mind, and uh, handle things as they arise. I know, I think I, where did I read it? Maybe somewhere that like if you have things to do, do the hardest thing first. Do the thing that you least like to do first because then it's over and that's not hanging over your head anymore where it's like, oh, I'm gonna have to do that thing that I hate. Just do the tricky thing first and then the rest will feel like playing because you'll, you won't have the weight of that, that not fun task. That's why I scoop litter boxes in the morning. <laughs> I don't actually mind it that much. I was talking to, I think my husband, this weekend about, you know, just the gross things I've had to do in my life. I'm, I'm, I do not, I have a pretty strong, uh, I don't, I don't gag very easily and I don't get grossed out very easily. And I know that you've all seen me smell things. I just don't get grossed out. And, you know, I worked at a shelter and have volunteered at a shelter and have fostered kittens and raised two boys. and. Um, I had to clean up a colostomy bag spill at the bookstore one time and uh, you know I've cleaned bathrooms in public places and you just well I mean you either deal with it or you don't you either get used to it and just say well this is not that big of a deal it's just a smell right you don't have to eat it <laughs> you know I guess it's just being able to keep it keep it separate right grumpy so I don't mind I don't mind the litter boxes so much once in a while, once in a while, but you just got to keep on top of it. Okay, so I'm going to show you where I ended up. Let's see where, how much time I have left. Oh, see, that's almost perfect. 2.13 left, so we're going to press home to open and cancel it. And so this is as far as I got. Here, Hamrock. 
Okay. Okay, so there's, oops. That's as far as I got. That's his little, his little army arm. And so that's gonna be really cute. It's gonna be really cute. And I like, I like the thread. It's fun to use a different uh, company's thread. I don't play favorites generally. I think every thread company has got something going for it. I don't like Krynik very much. And it's not that it's, Krynik is a perfectly lovely thread. I just, metallics are such a pain in the booty. Um, gosh, when was the last time I even used? I One time I blended blending filament with over dyed thread and it looked really cool. It was on a Halloween something. It was just like that, oh, what is it, 032 Krynic blending filament where it's kind of a pearly, um, you know, almost, almost, it not really see-through, but just very nondescript color. And that was really, really cool. I wonder if I could work, I don't know, it might be fun to work that into something. Uh, plans for the rest of the evening? It's, what is it, 6 o'clock? I'm going to probably stitch till midnight because I can. And... Um, I hope that you guys are having a good weekend. It was nice to spend time with you today. I wish everybody could come over and stitch. Uh, it's one of the things that's nice about retreats, and I think people get so excited about going to retreats, is that just to sit and sit with other stitchers. Uh, I don't know. I feel like we ha we all have a lot in common. We're not all necessarily the same age or from the same walk of life, and I think, you know, there are shy people and boisterous people and, you know, all, all different kinds of stitchers but for some reason like just having stitching in common who else can you be like and then I got the most beautiful piece of hand dyed 40 count and it was a Zweigert base like who can you say that to when they're like really nobody not one person nobody you can't you can't have the kind of conversations nobody else gets it right and then I went to the shop and they had these out of print prairie moon charts and they were half price <laughs> people on the elevator would be like oh lord please 10th floor where are you so i mean it's, it's just fun to hang out with other stitchers and talk shop right you guys have a good week i will make a stitchy tube as soon as i can i have to figure out what i'm all into i've got a couple things and um hopefully i'll get that pin cushion finished i'll try to get that pin cushion finished Maybe tomorrow night I'll, I'll drag out the sewing machine and finish up that pincushion so that can be a, an FFO on my next video to show something that I actually finished for once. I have some framing to take in to, to um, Neblets and pick out some frames and things like that. But with the workers here, you know, they painted so everything came off the walls. So my plan is, for, at least for anything that's not in here, is to just have every, to bring everything together and then just re-decide where things go because I just went up to the attic and there's needlework up there that's framed that I'm like, oh, I didn't know this was up here. Right, Ruby? You just, I don't know. I When you run a shop and stitch a lot, you end up with a lot, a lot of needlework just kind of all over the place. And it's not that I take it for granted, but I do a little bit because, you know, I my shop at any one time had like 150 models. And so some of them, some of them, you know, I sold or gave away and then, you know, others I, I have hanging all the time and then some of them just are in storage. And I, the, the tricky thing for me is the, the seasonal stuff where it's like the 4th of July. I, I love what Priscilla and Chelsea do. Hi, baby girl. Are you so nice? I love what Priscilla and Chelsea do as far as, um, you know, making displays and things. And maybe that's something I can work towards is, um, I guess I need to get a hutch. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll look for one at the Lucky Rabbit, right? What do you think? <laughs> I say goodbye. Ruby says goodbye. And I will hang with you 